We're very honored to have uh, Dr. Professor Fulvio de Blasi with us. He's an attorney and a legal mediator and a philosopher and expert in St. Thomas Aquinas. So thank you, uh, uh, Fulvio. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Robert, and thank you very much, Jane, for this uh, very important uh, conference on this subject. And uh, we don't have much time, so I'll try to be as, as quick as I can. Okay. Is this fine with the microphone? Can you hear me correctly? OK. So uh, I want to focus on the, some key concepts uh, related to the intrinsic evil actions. And uh, the premise is that clearly there are some subtleties on which philosophers you know, like to uh, debate you know, with one another, they quarrel uh, a lot. Today I take this, uh, this uh, talk as a focus on what we have in common, not on what the differences may be on subtleties, which are legit, I mean, at certain point. But I think that there are some, uh, uh, some things that uh, are out of the discussion and should, we should work on them to be faithful to the magisterium of the church. I will focus on Veritatis Splendor, but first I, I want to give a taste of pre-Christian classical ethics too, and, but Father Piotr stole two uh, out of three quotations I selected from Aristotle, so I, I'll be very quick about that. So yes, this is the one that Father Piotr read. It's clearly, you know, the doctrine of intrinsic liberal actions is in Aristotle. You skip the last part in which he actually uses adultery as an interesting example. Nor does goodness or badness with regard to such things depend on committing adultery with the right woman at the right time and in the right way, but simply to do any of them is to go wrong. And I think this is important for, I, I, I'm just reading a few things and then I'll comment upon them later. <laughs> then there is a quotation, the, the one you, you, know, you said for my uh, talk. <laughs> This is, uh, uh, well, I read it and then comment it. As we have said, then, courage is a mean with respect to things that inspire confidence or fear in the circumstances that have been stated. And it chooses or endures things because it is calon to do so or because it is based not to do so. But to die to escape from poverty or love or anything painful is not the mark of a brave man, but rather of a coward. For it is softness to fly from what is troublesome, and such a man endures death, not because it is cologne, but to fly from cocon. <laughs> now, now, the context is suicide. Suicide has always been seen as an intrinsic evil action by you know, pre-Christian, post-Christian, <laughs> not Christian philosophy. It's, uh, it does have a very long tradition. But what surprises me is that even the revised Ox Oxford translation of Aristotle translates cologne and cocon as noble and evil, while in Aristotle, is the, it's a key point to connect ethics with aesthetics. There is a beauty in, uh, in the moral goodness. The moral goodness is attractive. The Aristotle's Phronimus, the good person, right, is uh, the hero of a movie. It's the reason why when we watch a movie and there is a very good person acting, we have goosebumps. <laughs> we get excited. We want to be like that person, like Jesus. Jesus is the Phronimus in, in Catholic ethics. And the focus on moral beauty is very important because we, you know, the Aristotle taught that the proximate rule of uh, moral action is actually the way the Phronimus would act. In Christian ethics is the way in which Jesus would act. What would Jesus do? Hmm? And I need, I, I have to be really honest with you, I don't feel comfortable even having to address these issues in a conference like this. Uh, because I think that we are giving too much importance to something which is not beautiful at all. Are we making the world more beautiful or definitely ugly as hell? I mean, what are we talking about? I mean, is, uh, is really, you know, I'm sorry I'm being blunt, but uh, sometimes it's important. So the very idea that we are trying to leg le legitimize, for example, you know, a union uh, in which we need a fake penis to make marital love possible, or in which we have anal sex. I mean, would Jesus do that? I mean, is this beautiful? I mean, is this really that important that deserves to put in danger the entire tradition of the church? I don't think it is, but anyway, here we are. We are forced to do this, and I'll be honest, in, in other circumstances, I wouldn't even care about these things. So I feel like uh, we are forced 
to do something which is degrading his base, and uh, and I'm not really uh, not considering. Uh, weakness in human beings, right? Even Aristotle was clear about forgiveness in the context of the voluntary and involuntary actions. This is the other, you know, quotation, right? That Father Piot read. This is an interesting context, right? There are pressures, says Aristotle, which overstrain human human nature and and which no one could withstand. These things would make the action involuntary. In no criminal system, people would be put in jail if there is such a pressure, right? But in this context, Aristotle explains that pleasures and beauty cannot make the action involuntary. They're not pressure. <laughs> They're not enough of a pressure to do that. So it, we are talking about different pressures that makes, make the action involuntary. I need to save my life. Hmm? And I sacrifice the, the life of another person. But there is uh, some kind of emergency, a real pressure. I'm, I'm tortured. I'm threatened to life, right? Uh, morality requires heroism, men of principles, truths that cannot be bargained or compromised. Then there are reasons to affirm that without intrinsic evil actions, there is not truly uh, an ethical, an ethics, or a moral person or a moral order worthy of the name. So no wonder that veritatis splendor is in defense of the human being, as is evident to the question of the morality of human acts and in particular the question of whether there exists intrinsic evil acts, we find ourselves faced with the question of man himself, of his truth, and of the moral consequences flowing from that truth. By acknowledging and teaching the existence of intrinsic evil in given human acts, the church re remains faithful to the integral truth about man. She does respect and promotes man in his dignity and vocation. Consequently, she must reject the theories set forth above which contradict this truth. And no wonder it's also in defense of an objective moral order. Without the rational determination of the morality of human acting as stated above, it would be impossible to affirm the existence of an, ob of an, an objective moral order and to establish any particular norm, the content of which would be binding without exception. This would be to the detriment of human fraternity and the truth about the good and would be injurious to ecc ecclesial communion as well. So veritatis splendor is really <laughs> Well, another, another point, and then focus on Veritatis Splendor directly. You know, Veritatis Splendor warns us about uh, putting ethics against ethics. Okay, <laughs> let's go back to key concepts in moral philosophy. It is a practical science. What it means is that it's impossible by definition to have a, a theory which is opposed to practice. If, if we have a moral truth or a moral norm which is not supposed to be lived, it's not a moral norm, it's not a moral truth. It belongs to a different science, which is theoretical. So the practical nor moral truth is supposed to be practical, it's supposed to be lived. So one of the key points of the Veritatis Splendor document is precisely to warn us against an, a challenge to ethics, which is uh, using a sort of pastoral solution as a way to basically remove the moral truth from, from a human practice. Using a creative hermeneutic, <laughs> this is <laughs> amazing, you know, going backward, right or forward. This is uh, a banana republic situation, really, and it's, it's going to be the more and more like this as we go on through the Veritatis Splendor, because, you know, I'm, I'm sorry to say that uh, probably using a, a language I would use in a court of law, right? I'm, I have this, uh, this vice and defect of being also a lawyer, but... Uh, I would say, okay, this is a situation which uh, has a sequitur power. I mean, every time we have some people in charge of some key places in the church, it's like they want to demolish everything that is done before. But if the magisterium of the church is treated this way, there is no church at all. Is this worth it? I mean, is, is homosexual marriage worth it? Is contraception worth it? Oh, come on, I want some he real heresies here, like Aryan <laughs> heresies. I, I would love to talk about the real nature of Jesus Christ. I mean, I can see a battle there, a serious one, but this is so degrading. I mean, seriously. So the importance of Veritatis Splendor, this is really important, is the highest magisterium of the church systematically addressing and explaining the very foundation of moral theology is not just one document among many. This is actually the document that addresses this thing. It's not just that it's a quotation you know, that happens to be there. 
And it's also not just a document coming from one person. You know, you remember that, right? It's been drafted and sent to all the bishops in the whole world. This is an ecclesiastical achievement. It was drafted together at the same time with the catechism. The only reason why it was promulgated, the catechism was promulgated first, and even Ratzinger explained this in the presentation of the catechism and the Veritatis Splendor, is that uh, it was important to state the truth we believe in before explaining it. But this is an ecclesiastical document, so it's, it, it does have a much more a higher importance for the magisterium of the church. It's not just a document we can put aside as if it were not there. So, uh, and the whole point of this document is to condemn theories which it denies it deny intrinsic evil actions both in theory and in practice. This is the whole point of this document. The whole point of this document is this. And we'll see at the end of, if I reach the end of this talk, we'll see that it's actually double condemnation. It's like saying John Paul II makes the first, you know, the, the church really makes the first condemnation of theories that denies this. Then he gave just one example about contraception, interestingly enough. And then he says it again, there is a second condemnation, it's like saying, if you are distracted, I'll say it again, here it is, right? So it's not something that you know, can be taken you know, <laughs> as if it were just a distraction by the magisterium. Now there are some key points I, I, I'll go through very quickly, and then I'll focus on the main structure. My, the, main, the main point of my, of my talk is uh, to focus on the very conceptual structure of the analysis of the moral action. But I want to go quickly through some key points. And of course, the foundation of the moral order in God is a beautiful, you know, light motif of the entire first part of the of the encyclical, uh, based on the dialogue with the rich young man. You, you know, that is really a beautiful document. It's beauti we, I, this is a document that we want to read to become more beautiful ourselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, but what I want to focus on is that this document takes into account that we are weak compared to the law. It's part of the picture. We are not so, it looks like today we want to be so soft with people because come on, this is not a possible good. Having just one wife for the whole life, okay, this is not possible. Let's have more than one, right? So, uh, or maybe you really, you want to have this kind of sex, just do it. If you're really convinced about it, just do it. So, uh, but we are supposed to be heroes and saints. This is part of the picture. It's not like we are, you know, useless people who need to give up to pleasures. This is not what the human being is supposed to be. It's, is it possible? No, it's not possible. That's why there is grace. This world is a magical world. We are, we are in a world in which natural and supernatural coexist. We, there are angels in this room. And God is Emmanuel, he's with us, he wants to be with us. Grace and law go together, that's why we can. So when we assume that we cannot, so we have to change the moral norm, we are actually making an act of atheism compared to our theology. Because we want to know, I can't, but with your help I can. That's the, the answer. And that's why we can be you know, very strong, not because we are strong, but because God is with us. And this is probably one of the key points I think I invite you to read in, in between the lines of the entire document of Veritatis Splendor. I can focus on the, you know, uh, participated theonomy is too big, but of course, you know, there is, uh, the law is also inside us, it's the meaning, it's what we really want. Robert Spayman explained this beautifully. I mean, the reason why we have the moral conscience problem is that we want something which is the true good, and this true good wants to emerge above our pleasures and pains. That's, that's why what we really want is the moral law that, you know, of which the conscience is our voice, the inner voice, which is a dialogue with God, with the higher level of, uh, uh, of, uh, of truth that we should obey to, not manipulate. This is what moral conscience is about, is obeying a higher truth. It is, it is, it is somehow transcendent by itself. One key point of the encyclical is also stressing the unity of the human person with spirit and body. This is one of the key points. The, the document really focuses on this. We need to focus on the true meaning of natural law in the human person as a whole, body and spirit. So 
A doctrine which dissociates the moral act from the bodily dimensions of its exercise is contrary to the teaching of scripture and tradition. There is no ambiguity, ambiguity in this sentence. So it's not just about an act of love detached from material reality. That's not the tradition of church. This is, it, it, there is no world in which this sentence can be interpreted as uh, something that is uh, historically determined. Hmm? Otherwise, I mean, we can delete even all the books debating why Aristotle is different than Hegel, Kant, Plato, because, you know, this is really simple. That's difficult, right? So here, I don't, read to the, I don't want you to read the whole thing, but just to get the, the sense of the technical meanings involved, right? We have a human being with several natural inclinations grounded on our bodily existence that take a moral meaning compared to the unity of the person, the unified totality of the human person. When we focus on this unified totality, we find the moral dimension, which is uh, the true love we need to have for the person, which raises us above to the true, to the true love for God. So there is this double step everywhere in the encyclical, from the human person, the totality of the human person, to the true love for God as the ultimate end. And of course, the negative precepts are supposed to reveal, not to deny personal dignity. It's not something that we somehow need to suffer because there is this truth, right? And we cannot do anything <laughs> but accept it. No, it's actually the way to, to be happier. When we, are, when we act following our moral conscience, when we are people of principles, we find our true nature, we are happier. I mean, it's true. And I, I, I can tell you, I witnessed so many even young people who are really sad because they don't know what, true, what, what is true or false. They don't take them seriously. They have all the pleasures they want. That doesn't make them happy. Conscience and truth, even here, conscience, and it's been already stated in previous you know, lectures today, is not uh, creative, is uh, just the way it, it works through reasoning, we know that, but reasoning starts with some uh, premises which are necessarily premises of reasoning. So the, con the conscience just is the application hmm, to the concrete circumstances in the here and now of the universal law. There is no other concept of conscience that makes sense in our tradition. And again, I mean, it's not like the moral truth is something that, uh, oh, unfortunately I know it, but you're lucky, you don't know about this truth, so you can do whatever you want with your marriage. No, that's not <laughs> how it works, right? So the encyclical clearly wants to tell us that there is something missing in the real fulfillment of the person if they don't know the fullness of the truth. And here, even the fundamental choice, and in, uh, it's uh, a key section of the encyclical, right? And uh, I like it to explain it this way. So, uh, and I'm really shocked that there is all this pastoral journey for divorced people that to me is kind of awkward. It's like saying, sure, it, it's an adultery, but if you're really convinced that this is the right woman at the right time for you, okay, that's fine, you can do it. So <laughs> basically, going back to Aristotle uh, quotation, this is actually revealing. It's, uh, the, the encyclical wants to say clearly that uh, there is a nature of particular actions that is connected to our bodily dimension, which determines the way in which we can respect ourselves as people. If we choose the wrong act, we become, somehow we damage our person as a whole. It's not like if we have a, a basic choice for love, then we can do whatever on the path to this love, because the particular act doesn't, doesn't matter. That's not the way the Veritatis Splendor works. So if we want to interpret the magisterium in the Veritatis Splendor, we already know that this cannot happen. Hmm? This is not what is supposed to happen. Now, okay, let's go to the key part of my presentation, then shoot me when I, I am running out of time. So I want you to focus on these three conceptual steps. Hmm? And then I want to just, uh, uh, show you some passages in which they appear clearly. There is a first conceptual step in our analysis of the moral action, which is objective. Hmm? Is, uh, is would be, the, in the case of intrinsic level action, is just the step in which we focus on the object of the action as a, as a way to understand the species of the action. Of course, in other cases, we, we add the circumstances when relevant, but the point is that we study 
it, the, the action we perform objectively need to be or, ordainable to, to the good of the person as a whole. Mm -hmm. There is a rational ordering of all our goods and natural inclinations to the good of, of the, the person needs totality. And this cannot depend on just the intention and needs to consider the bodily, the bodily dimension. This is the met methodological step, the key one for the encyclical. Then we have two conceptual steps which are intention-based, but they come after. I, I like to distinguish the two, even though they are not that much distinguished in the encyclical, it's not that important. But what is important, I think, is to understand that, of course, the intention affect our moral uh, life and the moral analysis of the action, but there is a level of the intention which we actually accept voluntarily the objectivity of the action. And then we have a higher level in which we deliberate or, or order this very r human reality we understand to the ultimate end in God. So, and here again we have object plus intention, but uh, at the higher level of the ultimate perfection of morality. Mm -hmm. Now, let's scan quickly this in, uh, in the encyclical, right? So, the morality of X is defined by the relationship of man's freedom with the authentic good. Acting is morally good when the choices of freedom are in conformity with man's true good and thus express the voluntary ordering of the person towards his ultimate end, God himself, the supreme good, in whom man finds his full and perfect happiness. Again, uh, the rational ordering of the human act to the good in, the, in its truth and the voluntary pursuit of that good, known by reason, constitute morality. Activity is morally good when it attests to and expresses the voluntary ordering of the person to his ultimate end and the conformity of a concrete action with the human good. The true good of the person, the ultimate end, you, you, you notice that there is a voluntary pursuit as something, as a conceptual, a, a conceptual uh, uh, plus compared to the rational ordering as such. But then there is also the voluntary ordering to the ultimate good, the deliberate ordering, ordering of the human acts to God as the ultimate end, which is called also the teleological character, the ultimate one of the of moral life. So there is a, a capability of being ordered, hmm? which is the first step. And then we have the intention-based analysis, but this ordering to one's ultimate end is not something subjective, dependent solely upon one's intention. It presupposes that such acts are in themselves capable of being ordered to this end, insofar as they are in conformity with the authentic moral good of man, safeguarded by the commandments. Well, okay, I'm not gonna read all the quotations, but uh, this is gonna be published eventually with Jane. We, are, we, we definitely want to make this, uh, this happen. Now, going back to the doctrine of the object of the moral action. Hmm? First of all, I want to highlight the, the, a quotation that shows that the will is involved in the concrete choices. Some authors do not take into sufficient consideration the fact that the will is involved in the concrete choices which it makes. These choices are a condition of its moral goodness and it's being ordered to the ultimate end of the person. And then we have this crucial key point of the per about the perspective of the acting person. You know, This is the point that is being used by many people attacking somehow the traditional teaching, saying, you know what, you cannot really describe the object of the action without the intention. So clearly, there is no objectivity in the description. You need to put the intention into, into, the, into the, the picture. This is both a very, a, a very important point for the good magisterium, but also a weak point for people who want to attack it. So it's a crucial you know, point that we need to address. The morality of the human act depends primarily and fundamentally on the object rationally chosen by the deliberate will, as is borne out by the insightful analysis still valid today by St. Thomas, made by St. Thomas Aquinas. In order to be able to grasp the object of an act which specifies that act morally, it is therefore necessary to place oneself in the perspective of the acting person. Now, I want to make this, this very simple, as simple as I, I was thinking, how can I make this very simple? Okay, I, I hope I, I, I did it, because I think that we do it all the time. In criminal law cases, for example, if you have a murder case, the first things you do as a judge or as an attorney is to evaluate, actually, the material cause-effect link between the death event and the presumed technical tool that caused the, 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 the death, like a gun or a stone, a drug, a poison, it is possible that the defendant wanting to kill but use tools unable to do so, a candy, for example. 
There are actually famous cases in which the person wanted to kill but didn't because the person was already dead. <laughs> So clearly, the action, materially speaking, couldn't actually accomplish this result. So is the person a murderer? Well, from the, from the viewpoint of the interior action, definitely it is. She, he or she is, right? But that doesn't mean that you can go on with the trial because there is no murder in the trial. So at times it may be difficult really to describe the material cause effect link, but still it needs to be done. It's the first step logically in any trial, even not just in criminal trial, even in civil, in tort law, in any kind of law in which you need to understand, you know, if there is actually something going on there. The second one is actually connecting the material event, if it, if it exists, to a voluntary agent. So basically, do I have a connection here? I don't care why you did it. I don't want your interior motives. I just want to know if this event out there is, uh, can be traced back to you as an intelligent being who knew what he was doing. Because again, maybe you, know, you didn't know what you, you were sleepwalking or drunk. Even if I connect the, two, the event to you as a material item, it doesn't mean that you are a murderer, right? So if I connect you, uh, maybe you were an actor in a movie. You know, there are some movies, very famous. One is actually the son of Bruce Lee was killed in a scene. But one of the bullets was real. So they were shooting at him and he actually died. <laughs> so there are several, there is a, actually a very recent one. I can't remember the actor in, in the States. But, you know, this happens. Sometimes, you know, there is the material event and there is a connection with the real person, but uh, there is no you know, uh, will or in, uh, intelligence involved. But the point is that if I do create a connection between intel an intelligent being and the material action, at that point I can call it a murder, because the murder is not just the event out there of which I know the cause and effect in the material world, is the event as it can be traced back to the intelligent being. At that point, I have a murder. I don't have just a person who died. I have a murder. And again, I don't, and, and so I can say that if I look at the, at the event from the perspective of the acting agent, at that point, I have the object of a human action. That's what it is. In, it's not that difficult, I mean, to, if, if we use common sense, right, and even some legal experience. So we have an external action for sure, we have an internal action, but so far we don't need the internal action. The internal action can be, for example, that you kill someone for stealing a diamond. Or maybe you kill, so the, the stealing would be the act that formally, formally defines you more as a person. But you kill someone, that's the external action. The external action is related to your intention, sure, because I connected it to your, you as a free agent. That's what it is, the analysis of the object. The will is involved. Again, some authors don't get it. <laughs> then we, ha we can have specific purposes, even in the trial, right? So we can have excuses, aggravating or mitigate, mitigating circumstances. Uh, you stole, but to, to donate, like Robin Hood, you know, to the poor or whatever. But you know, you st you, you still, you know, a, a, a committed that that action, right? So here we have a, an explanation, an easy one for uh, the famous, very difficult Aquinas passage, passage, in which he says, you know, if you steal to commit adultery. You are more adulterer than a thief, but still you stole. I mean, <laughs> still you stole it. <laughs> so the point is that the external action is there, and it involves definitely your intention, your will. It is a connection with, with the material world, with the, a, 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 the intention of an agent, because when you act, when you choose to steal, to kill, you accept that event, you make it your own. That's why it becomes an action. But then you did it for other reasons, and so you are more of an adulterer, fine. But I'm not putting you in jail for your in, in, in internal you know, <laughs> motive. I'm condemning you because you actually stole, you killed. I mean, this is what I can do in the criminal trial. The interior motive, it's another action, it's an internal action, fine. Now, describing the action may be difficult, but under the underlying logic remains. For example, and lawyers, are, they know these things very well. You know, sometimes the external context is a human reality. For example, stealing presupposes the principle that determines who is the owner of something. 
It requires an assessment of the state of need of the alleged thief, which affects his intention. Does he want to steal or to save his life? You know, we know that when we describe the world in terms of private property, we are using the principle of universal destination of goods, and we are using the principle that uh, if I really need something to exist, that's mine, <laughs> because God created the, world, the, the, the goods of the world for everybody, right? So, but this already is a description of the external context, which involves already a human reality. It may be difficult, but still, the logic of connecting the action to the agent remains the same. It's just more difficult to understand. Is there an aggressor, an aggressor in the material context is the alleged murderer a victim? Was he defending himself? Is this material context also a sexual intercourse or a rape? I mean, there are, there are two different descriptions there, even in, in the you know, uh, obvious, uh, you know, more easier, easier context of, a, of a, a, a court case. Was there a pressure which overstrains human nature and which no one could withstand, for which Aristotle would make the action involuntary? Was it self-defense? Is this device a both a contraceptive and a medicine? So the context of its use is sexual or medical. I mean, these things can affect, can make, it can make the description of the action difficult, but it can be done. The logic still the is still the same. And still, we need to describe the, the, what happens from the perspective of the agent. Now, here's the first condemnation. One must, must therefore reject the thesis characteristic of theological and proportionalist theories, which holds that it is impossible to qualify as morally evil according to its species, its object, the deliberate choice of certain kinds of behavior or specific acts, apart from a consideration of an intention for which the choice is made, or the totality of the foreseeable consequences of that act for all persons concerned. Now, I don't want to read all the quotations. Just after this condemnation, there is clearly the intention to base this condemnation on the doctrine of the object and the non-orderability of the object to the ultimate end and to the good of the person. And, uh, and then we have this uh, example taken from uh, Paul VI and, and, and contraceptives, which, by the way, makes this, uh, the condemnation of contraception pretty, pow pretty powerful in, mag in the magisterium of the church, because in the only encyclical, entirely committed to explain this very point that intrinsically evil actions are a protection of good morality and the dignity of the person. The only example used after the condemnation is contraception. So a good theology who would actually look at the magisterium with religious obedience and devotion cannot take this you know, as uh, something neglectable. Hmm? This is the reiteration, and I'm, and I'm done. Yes, conclusion. As difficult as it may be for philosophers to explain why some acts are intrinsically evil, the commitment to do so is praiseworthy and necessary in order to preserve the dignity of the person and the possibility of an objective moral order. Fortunately, we're not alone in this search because Revelation and the Universal Magisterium shows us the way. Thank you. Thank you.